Welcome everybody back to the next webinar here at uh, JFD. Welcome also in the name of JFD to everybody outside. It's good to have you here once again within those kind of webinars. My name Stefan, Stefan Friedrichowski. Um, and uh, today I will not uh, further introduce um, myself uh, personally, no, uh, today it's just the topic of what we want to discuss here. And that topic is DAX seasonal trading strategy. And that is quite an interesting topic because uh, you might learn a lot about uh, seasonals in general, about DAX in um, in particular. So it's um, both kinds what we want to discuss today. And um, yeah, once again, have a nice uh, warm welcome here to JFD. Good. But before I start, um, just uh, a few comments uh, before. Um, you might find already the slides of today's webinar in the go to webinar control panel, so you can download um, those slides directly uh, if you want. So that's one thing. The other one, um, during the webinar, I, once again, I will present an Excel sheet. Um, and if you want to have that kind of Excel sheet, just uh, get in touch with me. You see my contact address already here on the first slide. I know it's a little bit complicated with my last name, uh, but the email address is uh, s.friedrichowski at jfdbrokers.com. You will see it. And if you have those slides, then it will be uh, much easier for you to spell my name right. But anyhow, so that was the first remark. And the other one I have to make always here, um, of course. And um, we talk about trading strategies. And therefore, it's quite important uh, to mention uh, that risk disclaimer uh, in general, because even talking about trading strategies, and I will go um, into one trading setup in particular today about DAX seasonal day of week trading. Finally, when you trade, you trade on your own. Um, and uh, that is uh, something I have and I want to mention here. As always, you are responsible for your own trades. Um, I think that is um, quite obvious. But anyhow, so um, that is set. So we can directly um, dig into the topic of today and that is duck seasonal trading strategies so what i want to um go through here is um i want to start with the ducks in general a simple reason because i know and you might know as well that the ducks in general is one of those underlyings which are really difficult to trade and um, since now you know me a little bit more, that is something um, yeah, I have um, been investigating simply because I have tried to find out are there special reasons why DAX trading is more difficult or more, um, more obscure than other underlyings. And the answer is yes, we can find some statistical arguments uh, why DAX trading is on the one side more difficult, but on the other side, you will uh, find out that it is good to have that underlying in your overall portfolio as well. And that is related with costs of trading. But I want to show you uh, how to investigate uh, something like that and to give an answer to the difficulty of trading the DAX simply by doing two analysis and um, then we can draw immediately the conclusion why DAX is more difficult than, under, uh, than other underlikes. Finally, then I go further into the seasonals in general. Um, because I want to introduce you in seasonals of um, stocks, seasonals uh, of any underlying, simply that you understand the methodology uh, behind seasonals and that you get familiar with uh, that kind of method. 
Finally, we go back to the ducts, and uh, that means we will do a certain analysis um, for uh, DAX values, DAX price changes, and you will learn that there is a relationship between the day of the week, that means Monday, Tuesday, and so on, and the typical movement within such a day. And there's a strong relationship between um, the day of the week and the overall market, and finally to the individual move within that specific day of the week. Learning that, and if we realize that there's a strong relationship, that opens us the opportunity to, to have a, a trading setup based on the day of the week and the overall market situation. And that is uh, what I will finally um, show you, that you have a complete DAX trading strategy at the end of that webinar. And it's quite easy to follow. You don't need any expert advisors. You don't uh, need complicated indicators. Um, it's really easy. We only need one indicator, that is the EMA, one EMA, and we need to know what day of the week we have. And I think to answer that question is really easy. But anyhow, so let's start with this first step um, with the problem ducks. And you see that I <laughs> just named my slide the problem ducks. Normally, one uh, sh should not talk about problems. We like to talk about solutions, but you will see there is a solution. Just looking to that chart, and within the chart, you have uh, the DAX values for the last 16 or 17 years, uh, uh, the blue line. And I've indicated uh, one EMA within the chart, um, and uh, that line is red. If we look to that chart, we would draw the conclusion, wow, trading is that easy. You see, immediately, all the possibilities for maybe in total 10 trades and extremely profitable trades uh, you might have opened here. Starting here, then you would open a short trade and maybe you have realized a lot of profit already here. Wait uh, a couple of months, opening the next short trade, wow, next big step down uh, to the south and so on, and then opening a long trade. You know the story. And uh, you may already realize that <clears throat> I'm a little bit laughing here because that's how a lot of people look to their chart and say, wow, trading is extremely easy. I know what to do. Um, it's either long or short, but the question is always, what is the right timing? And learning from that chart means we know the future and then it's always easy to anticipate the next movement because we know the future. So looking, for example, here, we know that we should open the short trade. Being exactly here, hey, why not opening a long trade? And so you know all those, those kinds of questions and um, finally you have realized by your own that trading is by far not that simple than a chart like this would um, indicate. So trading is much more complicated and especially tax trading. In this case, um, I look to a long-term behavior and uh, later I want to go in more daily considerations and then you see already it was in that chart even um, it is 16 months you see that the DAX is quite a lot wiggling around here so going up and down up and down and if you really ask yourself the questions when you open even if you open a long trade maybe at that position hey you need a stop loss and um it might be that already within the next day, you are kicked out of that trade simply because the DAX has reached your stop loss. So finally, it's much more complicated. And that wiggling around seems to be already 
a part of the answer why DAX trading in general is more complicated than other. Having that in mind, um, we can do a complete comparison for two underlyings. And um, I want to compare now the DAX with the S&P 500. So the German index with the overall um, market index of the United States, and that is the uh, uh, S&P 500. And I want to have a look to two values or two considerations. One is to the so-called ATR, and um, that translates to average true range. You might know that indicator that gives you a little bit of um, the daily range. It's a little bit a measure of the volatility of the overall market. Um, we might look into the details of uh, that indicator or that function, which describes those values. But for now, it's enough to know it describes the volatility of the market. Uh, so high values in, AT, uh, in ATR, um, they are related to high volatility in the overall market. And the other question, which is important as well, if you, we want to open trades even for a little longer period of time, several days, then it's not only a question of how volatile the market is, it's also a question of what kind of absolute change do we, ha do we have from one day to the other, so from close to close. Um, so, for example, if I talk about DAX, uh, finally, I mean for uh, the, the F, so-called FDAX, the future DAX, and that closes at uh, 10 o'clock uh, p.m., in the evening, and I can ask the question, hey, what is a typical change from today, 10, to tomorrow, 10 p.m., and so on, and that may be for the last 16 uh, years. So that gives you the change from one day to the other, from one close to the other, and since I only want to answer the question in terms of movement, I look for the absolute, the absolute change close to close, so without any direction. So every number is positive finally. And doing that kind of analysis, um, I can create a chart like like this. Let me explain to you a little bit what does it mean if I talk about so-called pseudo histogram. Histograms, I'm sure you know. Histograms normally show you how um, many pieces are within a certain interval. In this case, I have done something similar, but a little bit more straightforward. It's uh, easier to, to, um, to do in Excel. Um, histograms are not that complicated, but let me try to explain what I have done here. You see in the blue line, the DAX ATR values for the last 16 years, but not in the sequence of the date, like the DAX we have seen in the chart. No, now in, in, the, in an increasing order of the values. That means we have in total a little bit more than 4,000 days, and the lowest ATR value ever has been a little bit below 1%. And the highest value ever is a little bit below 5%. So my scale on the y-axis is in percent. Um, so 0 0.01 um, stands for 1% and so on. And the ATR I use here, um, I think that has a period of 120. So it's a smooth EMA uh, ATR. So therefore, we don't have values close to zero and we don't have values up to 10%. So those values are a little bit more smooth. And you see that in total, the ATR values for the DAX, uh, the range is between 1% and nearly 5%. And now the astonishing result is doing the same kind of analysis for the S&P 500, we can see that in general, the S&P 500 has lower values for the ATR value. 
So it, it starts um, about at 0.7%. Uh, it goes up to the same level, so nearly 5%. But you see <laughs> that steep increase uh, at the end, that simply means that there are only a few values which have really high values of ATR. There are much more ducks days with high values of ATR than for the S&P 500. So what we can realize here is already part of the answer of why DAX trading is more complicated than other underlyings. It's simply because the ATR is higher. I have done every step here percentage-wise. So um, it's not of matter that the DAX uh, today is uh, at about 12,000 and the S&P 500 at about um, 2,200. I have done every calculation in percent. So it's not a matter of the absolute value. So we, we can conclude the ATR values of the DAX are much higher than of S&P 500. That's the first part of the answer of why DAX trading is more complicated. But let's look for the next one. I have done the same kind of analysis of what I call the pseudo histogram for those absolute changes from close to close. So from one day to the other. And now, once again, the scale is uh, um, in percent. That means 0.02 means 2%. And now we see, of course, we have uh, days with nearly zero change uh, from one day to the other. And of course, um, during the financial crisis uh, 2008, we have had changes of about 10% from one day to the other. It's good that we don't have that every day. Um, but now, back to the comparison between S&P 500 in red and DAX in blue. Once again, we see that the close to close changes for DAX are higher than for S&P 500. So for whatever reason, those changes are higher. That finally means, because you know that in, in, in the, on a long run, on a long term, um, percentage-wise, between the last 16 years, there's not that big difference between DAX and S&P 500. If now the close-to-close, -close, the absolute close-to-close -close changes are higher for the DAX, there's only one conclusion you can draw. It means it's more wiggling around because if those values are higher and the overall increase during the last 16 years <clears throat> is not higher, then we must have more positive negative values uh, in between. So that is a hint for more wiggling around once again. Let's compare those two results just with a, a single number. What I have calculated for those uh, 4,200 days is the overall average. And if I now say the DAX average, average true range, what a complicated uh, wording, uh, is nearly 2%. So then it's the average of the last 16 years. So 2% is a typical average true range for the DAX. And for S&P 500, only 1.4%. Okay, so we have higher values in ATR for DAX. And if you look for the comparison close to close, even there we have higher values for the DAX with 1.1 and 0.8 for S&P 500. That means if I just want to describe the different behavior between DAX and S&P 500, I can state that the S&P 500 works cleaner. So it's, it's more smooth uh, compared to the DAX. And that's obvious because of the smaller ATR values. And the overall variations going up, going down, going up, going down, which is indicated by the close-to-close -close values, 
are higher for the DAX values compared to the S&P 500 uh, values. Or in a single line, we can state the DAX is more bitchy than the S&P 500. That's, um, um, if I can, uh, if I would uh, hear you now, maybe you smile or you laugh. Honestly, I don't have a better wording for that. Uh, maybe you have. Um, what I mean is it's more wiggling around. It's going up, going down instantaneously without any reason. Uh, 20 points up, 30 points down, even 50 points up and then go down and so on and so on. Whenever you have traded DAX intraday, you know what I'm talking about. It's uh, a nightmare quite often that um, it's uh, always hitting your stop loss. Uh, wherever you set the stop loss, it's really complicated. And now I want to conclude or I want to go further with the DAX strategy. You may ask now, why? Why the hell is Stefan talking about the DAX uh, strategy when he first realizes that uh, trading the DAX is that complicated? There's a good reason. We have to choose the right time scale for our trade and the other good reason is that if we look to the costs of trading then DAX trading is more or less maybe with one exception and that's euro US dollar the cheapest underlying to trade what does it mean we have to look for the relation between spread and price of that underlying. You know, when I talk about trading, you will hear very often the sentence, in the millisecond you open a trade, you are in the minus. Why? You lose the spread instantaneously. So opening a trade means being in the minus. So we lose the spread when we open the trade. Knowing that typically if we trade, we trade more, let's say, on a percentage scale. We look for a movement of 1%. Then it's, for example, the DAX, it means 1% at 12,000 points is 120 points. And but now we have to compare our one point spread which we have at JFD for trading the DAX with that 1% movement of 120 points or we can directly compare the one point spread with the overall price of the DAX and that is 12,000. So that relation one point against 12,000 is very very good. Do the same consideration for S&P 500. S&P 500 is at 2,200 points, spread is 0.4. So if we now calculate the quotient between spread and price, you realize, hey, trading the DAX is about a factor of two more, or is cheaper than um, trading the S&P 500. So that's a good reason why DAX is not that bad to trade because it has nearly the lowest costs of trading. So once again, um, Euro, US dollar is another pair uh, which is quite similar uh, and is uh, very good to trade uh, with respect to costs of trades or costs of trading. Um, but DAX is really good for that. And DAX is at least... Um, the best index you can trade if you look for the costs of trading, if you look for the relationship between spread and price. So there's a good argument. And the other one is um, the good argument to trade the DAX. And the other one is we have to do the right things. So not looking for trades within um, one minute or 10 minutes. No, let's look on a daily basis. So that's good but not too long. So we, we don't want to have overnight trades, so we don't have swap costs or whatever. Um, 
and that is the right time scale we can look for. And that the strategy I want to introduce now is simply, whoops, uh, sorry, I um, pressed the wrong button, but in a second I will be back on uh, the right slide. That brings me to the topic of seasonals. Finally, we will do duck seasonal on the base of a day of the week. But in order to introduce that topic of seasonals, let's look first uh, outside uh, all our um, stock related activities. Let's look to the mother of all seasonals. And that's, of course, simply the climate. Um, just wait a second uh, and don't be irritated that I'm now talking about climate and uh, and weather and uh, not about uh, pr stock prices or whatever. But it's much easier to introduce a concept of seasonals by looking to that kind of diagram. What you see here um, is uh, the climate data uh, from my personal nearest uh, weather station, and that is Dresden Klotsche, um, which is indicated here. And then you see typical behavior like this. Describing um, that kind of diagram is uh, quite easy. I mean, yeah, within summer time, we have the highest temperatures and then it goes down for winter and for the next summer, it goes up again. Why do I show that kind of uh, graph here? Simply because seasonal charts try to find seasonal behaviors. And that is later related to stock prices as well, because what we want to have is those cyclic behaviors or reoccurring events like here, like when we look for weather or climate. If I would ask you the question, hey, give me an estimate of uh, what is uh, within July, what is the temperature of tomorrow, hmm, you would answer, 25 degrees and you will not be that bad and if you would have answered minus uh, or uh, three degrees most probably you are wrong so what do you use finally when you use seasonals you use the information of what is reoccurring and exactly that kind of information can be found in stock prices as well if you look right so it's cyclic behavior, reoccurring event, events that we are looking for. And if we found those, we can use that information, which give us a better estimate of what we have to do. Like if you get the task, please estimate the temperature of July, um, you will look to that chart, of course. There's another um, a uh, well-known um, seasonal, and that is the Dow Jones index for the four-year election cycle of uh, the United States. That chart looks for the four years election cycle. That means, you know, that every four years they uh, in the United States, they have uh, their government uh, or president uh, election, and you can divide that period in, for example, four terms or in, in four uh, intervals. One is the election year itself, the post-election year, the midterm, and the pre-election year. And everything is reoccurring every four years. And what that guy here, this Dimitri Speck, has done, he has been looking for the Dow Jones well used for the last hundred or even more uh, years and has been creating that kind of chart by normalizing everything to 100 with the election year. And then he uh, has calculated exactly that kind of curve. What does it mean or what kind of conclusions can we draw from that chart? One obvious conclusion is that if we are in the third year, then overall, we don't have much movement within the market. The highest movement within a year we have in the pre-election year. So 
in the pre-opening long trade in the pre-election year might be a good uh, conclusion. So that is something we can look for and that kind of conclusions we can draw here. Still there's a but and my but about this chart or those kind of charts is that in lots of um, examples we only have a pure or let's call it a weak statistics. In this case it's statistics is not that bad. At least we have 100 years so we average um, we have 25 uh, years uh, of election, 25 years of pre-election and so on and so forth. So at least we average over 25 values. If you see other charts for seasonals, they might only average 10 years and then they look for the ducks uh, movement within January or February and so on. So the statistics is in most cases what I would call a pure statistic or really weak. And the other point I have to mention is that we normally have um, overall trends. You know that, for example, uh, the Dow Jones within the last 100 year has been uh, increasing. There's no question. And going into numbers and maybe not doing it percentage-wise right. Within the last 100 year, the, the average year-to-year -year change is about 6%. We have a 6% increase. And that is being reflected here as well. So if you compare the, the starting of 100 and going up to 125, that is about those 6% a year. So we we have that overall bias, that overall trend within the Dow Jones, with, which is not the best to have that already um, in that chart. So going to, to really um, to good conclusions is difficult. But nevertheless, what we can do is we can try to find seasonals, which are much better statistic. And so we have to go a little bit down, not on months uh, or years, no. We have to go down to days. And doing so, then we can uh, find very good relationships between typical movements, typical days, and so on. So the common method we apply here is that we look for cyclic reoccurring events and those events create a common pattern. Think back to my climate diagram uh, of the temperature in, in, in Dresden. That is a common pattern. And if we have those common patterns, then we can trade them. In general, those events might be the months like January, February and so on, or the day of the month, which is interesting as well. Um, because then you look, for example, the beginning of the, of a month, and that is good for stock trading to have a difference between the beginning of a month, the midterm of a month, and the end. Uh, you can can find relations, price relations there as well. We go today into the day of the week. That means we differentiate between Monday, Tuesday, and so on, and that opens us a much better statistic because if we now look back for 16 years prices um, we have about 250 trading days um, a year and that means we have 50 times a Monday and 50 times a Tuesday and now having that for 10 or 15 years that is a much better statistic. Finally, we might go down um, the time frames even to hours or whatever. Um, then we would have typical behavior within a day and we might find there as well some uh, profitable relationships. The overall assumption here, everything repeats. But that kind of assumption is true or is a base assumption for trading at all, that we find something in the past 
which we trade tomorrow once again. And the question we want to ask, answer now within uh, the Excel sheet I will present you is, is there a bias between the day of the week and the typical trade or price direction going up, going down? The answer will be we need one additional information that is the overall market. But back to if we have that relation between movements and the day of the week, hey, then we can use that kind of information for a quite cool trading strategy. Let me show you what I mean here um, directly. Just a second. Um, here we are. And I forgot to open the Excel sheet uh, before the webinar, but now it will open uh, within a couple of seconds. Um, let me already um, try to, to explain what we do here or what kind of analysis we are doing here. Um, so let me first zoom a little bit more here. So I start with uh, DAX values uh, since 99. Um, and of course, I have always those open, high, low, close values. And talking about DAX in this case means I talk about the so-called FDAX, the future DAX, uh, meaning that kind of DAX which opens at 8 a.m. and closes at 10 p.m. Later, we will see that we need an EMA um, and that is easy to calculate. And what we need um, is the day of the week, but that can be calculated in Excel um, quite easily. So there's a, a command for that, and that is weekday. And what we want to do now is we want to look for the different days of the week and the different kind of movements. Before doing that, let me first answer the question, and now you will find a couple of words here in German, but uh, let me guide you through. Uh, let me try to answer the question, is there an overall um, range or an overall dependency between the day of the week and the typical movement within the day? without the sign, so without long or short direction. And the clear answer that's uh, indicated by the blue bars, more or less no. Uh, what we can see is that the, we find the highest volatility uh, on Thursdays and the lowest volatility on Monday and Fridays. Um, but overall, there's no strong relationship. But that is without sign. So we don't ask the question in which direction. But now let's do it quite simple. What we need additionally, we um, need an overall market indicator. And that overall market indicator will be an EMA. Finally, it will be an EMA with a period of uh, 40. And that indicator um, should answer the question, are we in a bull market or in a beer market? And uh, to have that answer simply by is the value above, we call it a bull market, and is um, <clears throat> the value below that EMA, we are in a beer market. So that's my definition. Um, and now if you look for the relative movement according to the day of the week, hey, now it's getting a very interesting um, picture. What does it mean if we look, for example, to the Monday? And looking for the Monday, and you will find blue bars and red bars. Blue means we look for those days within the last 16 years, days in a bull market, meaning the value of the DAX is above the EMA, with that simple definition between bull and beer market. And having that bar here, that blue bar to the north, to positive values, means that a typical Monday 
in the bull market is a day where the price of the DAX increases from open to close. Okay, so within the bull market to expect that the price will increase hmm, is not that um, strange. I mean, that's more or less straightforward. And vice versa, by the way, uh, if we are in a short market, so in a beer market. But now the astonishing result is the next day, the Tuesday. Within or for Tuesdays, we can find that the typical behavior in a bull market is going to the south. So that means that is a reversal day. Tuesdays are those days where the difference between open and close goes exactly opposite to the market we are in. So in a bull market on Tuesdays, the average movement is to the south. And the average movement within a short market is to the north. So that's maybe a little bit surprising, but you might already have realized uh, just by trading your uh, uh, the DAX that you have those what sometimes is called a reversal day. And you can really prove that statistically by doing an analysis like this one. We will find that Wednesdays, Wednesday, <laughs> I'm not sure what is uh, um, the plural of uh, days, but anyhow, um, we have the same situation. We have to trade to the opposite. So on a Wednesday, being in a bull market, we should open a short trade because it's only close to zero, but it's going to the minus. So we have a bias to the minus and vice versa. On beer markets, we have a bias to the north on Wednesdays. Story goes further here with um, Thursdays. The Thursday and Friday are what I call normal days because it happens what should happen in a uh, in such uh, markets. So in bull markets, Thursdays go to the north, and on Friday we have the same. And that kind of analysis is only done by statistics, nothing else. So it's creating a bias for a specific day of the week. So the only thing we have to know in order to open the right trade is we have to know are we in a bull or beer market and that we do simply by the comparison to an EMA. And the other question is um, even easier to, to answer and that is uh, what day of the week uh, we have. And that's all. But now you ask yourself, hey, what uh, can I achieve uh, by applying those two simple rules? And if we only try to add the DAX points according to that setup, we have that kind of behavior of our equity. But um, looking for points <clears throat> is not the best because you know that uh, uh, 10 or 16 years ago, the DAX has been at uh, values of 5,000. So we have to do it uh, percentage-wise. And uh, that is something I have done within the Excel sheet as well. And then we can create really a typical equity line in terms of R, so typical risk of a trade. And within that Excel sheet, and once again, I repeat my offer uh, that you can have that Excel sheet if you want, just sending me an email. Um, you have the opportunity to, to even change the values. Uh, let me bring it a little bit more to the north here. Um, and then I can change some values. So what's good with in uh, that kind of consideration. We can, for example, change the EMA value here from 40 to, for example, 35. And then you see a little bit different equity line. And you might even say, hey, uh, it's uh, really getting better. Mathematically, it's um, 
a little bit um, worse than the previous one. Um, but that's the reason behind is that we have uh, higher drawdowns in the beginning, but then later uh, we have really a very good straightforward equity line, um, which is really something uh, looks like out of a textbook here. But uh, the other thing we can change within the Excel sheet, when we want to open a trade, I don't want to have open a trade without a stop loss, especially not on the DAX. Um, now the trades we have here, they have a stop loss as well. Um, and that kind of stop loss, we might change, for example, from 1.1% to 1.2%. And what you realize here is um, that uh, it doesn't really change the equity, at least not that much. And that is a good indicator that we have a quite robust strategy this kind of strategy has only two degrees of freedom namely the ema and the stop loss value and even if we change those two uh, values ema and stop loss percent it does not have that huge impact on our equity and that tells that is telling us that we have a really good kind of strategy. So let me summarize the roots for that kind of uh, uh, strategy. It's quite a, quite simple. And I will show you uh, some trading results as well on that uh, strategy in a second. So that is a summary. That is a trading setup for the DAX seasonal uh, trading strategy based on days of week, uh, based on the day of the week. What we do um, in order to be really precise, we compare the open at eight o'clock with the EMA value of the previous day. That comparison gives us the answer to the question, bull or beer market, that's it. And now it simply depends on that answer. Was it a bull market? Then we open on Monday, Thursday, and Friday. We would open a long trade and otherwise short, and exactly vice versa in beer markets. The trade entry is always at 8 a.m., so in the morning, and that's the one action of the day. We go with a stop loss of 1% of 1.1% of the open of our trade. That is the stop loss for the trade and we close the trade at 10 p.m. Maybe in between we have reached a stop loss. Also that will happen. But otherwise, trade is closed before the market is closed. And that's the complete setup. That's a complete kind of strategy. And um, it's uh, very good that this works that simple. And I'm not only um, talking about that kind of strategy that is um, in, finally what I want to have is to have that strategy uh, running via expert advisor and uh, that is the last test phase here now and you see here that for example today today uh, is uh, Wednesday we are far above the EMA so on Wednesday it's a day for opening a short trade. And yeah, trading result is not looking that bad. And I even can show you a little bit about the trading history, at least for the last uh, two weeks. Um, but otherwise, uh, I have the history of the Excel sheet. Um, but now let me create um, that report here. And then you will see um, some results for the last uh, couple of days and you see it's not working bad and still it's not a long-term history in a real uh, life uh, account but it's already not that bad to have even in those days an increase in our equity and that's going quite strange and straight um, so and that's simple 
Finally, for personal trading, you don't need really an expert advisor. It's only a question of comparing the um, open value to the EMA of the previous day and looking what kind of day we have, which day of the week we have. That's all. So it's easy to do. It's uh, very easy to implement that kind of uh, strategy. So I hope that might be something within your a strategy portfolio as well because it's really simple so my summary is seasonals are widely spread you can find them within the internet um, at lots of different places but most of them have unfortunately an insufficient statistics um, so I would not rely on all those things uh, you might find in the internet what we have concluded here is that the DAX has indeed a certain bias to the week of the, to the day of the week, but we have to differentiate between bull and bear markets. And finally, we have a complete strategy based on a single EMA, the EMA 40, with a stop loss of 1.1% uh, for opening a trade. And that's all. So it's a very good strategy, and I hope that you have learned a little, even a little bit more, not only the strategy itself, but a little bit to the question of why DAX trading is uh, more complicated than other underlyings. And even on the other side, why DAX trading is interesting because one is cost of trading and the other is, for example, that kind of strategy, that DAX seasonal strategy. So that's for now, that's for today. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. And uh, hope I can see you back uh, within next month. There will be additional webinars uh, from my end and my colleagues. So um, we have German webinars, we have English webinars. Just looking to the webpage of JFT Brokers, uh, and you will find interesting topics, interesting speakers, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. So thanks very much. Have a nice day. And for those who are interested in football, uh, in German football, today is what is called the German Classico. That means uh, Bayern Munich against uh, Dortmund. Um, it starts in 25 minutes, I think. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye.